to Charm Chats. Hoodly doo! Hello! Welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Kat. Today we are covering episode 409 Muse to My Ears. This one aired on December 13th, 2001, and the title is a play on Music to My Ears. And a muse, in Greek mythology, is an inspirational goddess. An occasionally backup singer. Hmm. If you see Hercules. Yeah. We're just going to get right on into it. Mm -hmm. Because we got some interesting shit to go down. Yes. So, we start off in the kitchen at the manor, where Phoebe is cutting up some vegetables... As Cole walks in. Cole is in a shirt, jacket, and pants, all in nearly the same shade of beige. Yeah. Mm. Apparently when he stopped being a demon, he also stopped having a fashion sense. Yeah. Mm. I long for a black turtleneck for that man. Hmm. Phoebe is in a full coverage apron, which is yellow, with what I think were supposed to be little cupcakes all over it. Uh, which she then pulls off to reveal a tight black dress. It looks to be held up by very thin strings. Which are is... doing that thing where it effectively is backless because mm-hmm. the strings, like, they go from the from the shoulders in front around over under the yeah. arms and then to the sides. Yeah, so it's it's very low in the back. Um, it, it's what I lovingly call a loop sleeves. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Because it's just, it's a loop of string, basically, yeah. that just goes around, and that's it. Mm-hmm. That's all you get. Um, her hair is mostly down, just pulled a little bit back with a small barrette, and it's very wavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Damn near curly, I'd say. Mm. He says she looks beautiful, but wonders where everyone else is. She thanks him and hands him a glass of champagne. She then tells him that she sent everyone else away so they could celebrate. And he's like, oh, well, well, what are you celebrating? She's like, oh, you're fully human now. We can get on with our relationship. Yeah. She clinks their glasses and takes a sip. Cole doesn't. And she reminds him how a toast works. Yeah. He's worried that she sent her sisters away because now he can't protect her since he doesn't have powers. She's like, uh, yeah, don't worry. They're in calling range. More importantly, I am in kissing range. And starts to kiss him. Yeah. Uh, She kisses his neck. He stops her and says that with the source injured, she might even be in more danger than before. She's like, dude, I need a night off. Yeah. Come on. She goes back to kissing his neck, asking if there's anything that she can do to help him relax, and kisses his cheek. And he he gets this really cute look on his face, and he's like, well, that that helps a little. And then he stops again because, you know, he's a man on a mission. Yeah. And he's like, he's still too worried about demons trying to kill the infamous charm ones to get enough recognition to be able to take out the source themselves, apparently. Yeah. At this point, the oven timer goes off, and he's like, oh, don't worry, I'll get it. And he reaches into the Uh, oven and pulls out the Pyrex, just with his hand. Yeah, he then quickly puts it down, crying out in pain. Which, you know, if it had actually been a hot dish, he would not have been able to pick it it up. No, 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 he wouldn't have been able to pick it up for that long. Because he was holding it on for, like, a good second, second and a half. Whereas, like, the, yeah. se- the second you fucking touch the hot pan, you're like, ah, and you pull away. You don't even pick it up. Right, but because he'd been a demon for so long, I kind of get the the possibility that he didn't think about it hurting until mm-hmm. it registered that it was hurting. Yeah, but then he when... would have had, like, third degree burns. Well, yes. By the time he set it down. Yes, but that's what I'm saying, is he shouldn't have been able to pull it out of the oven and put it on top of the oven. He should have just dropped it on the fucking floor. Yes. Just saying. Anyway, she goes over to him, asking if she should call for Leo. He says that it's fine, but he used to be able to hold fire in the palm of his hand. Like, yeah, you know... Technically, that was electricity, but okay. Mm, Yeah. And she reminds him that there's, you know, going to be an adjustment period after getting half of himself vanquished, and assures him that they'll figure it out together. Yeah. Aww. Mm-hmm. She gives him a nice little hug, and he's like, I'm serious about demons joining forces to attack. And she promises, she's like, I'll worry about that first thing in the morning, but the only forces I want to join are ours. And they kiss. And there is a major continuity issue where with where her hands are in the scene yep. when they're in front of the oven, because, like, they're just all over the place. They're up at his face, they're down by his waist, they're just everywhere. Mm-hmm. Huh. <sighs> yep. 
We then cut to an exterior shot of a building with pillars that looks like it's a museum or something, but it's apparently supposed to be some sort of government building. And then we find ourselves inside the office of a congressman who is practicing a speech about joining forces. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yep. The congressman, but not in a sexual way. No. The congressman is played by John Prosky. Possibly Prosky? I think it's probably Prosky. Hmm. He has 153 acting credits so far, starting back in 1986. He is the son of Robert Prosky, who is totally of that guy who I knew from Last Action Hero. He was the old guy who looked at the theater. But this isn't about Robert. It's about his son, John. John is of that guy in his own right. He's been in a ton of stuff. I recognized him from the few episodes of True Blood that he was on. You know. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, he's having issues with the speech. He's trying to find, like, an ending point or whatever. And then a bright light appears behind him. And a woman in a light blue-ish dress. It's tough to tell what color it is because yeah. she's basically transparent. Yeah, it's very um, glowy. And so I couldn't, I couldn't tell yeah. if it was white or supposed to be light blue or not. But mm-hmm. Yeah, and I immediately recognized her. I'm like, oh, hey, is that? And I went to IMDb. I'm like, fuck yeah, it is. Right. So this... But she is uncredited. Yes, yeah, she is. Mm. She is uncredited oh, as of Oh, IMDb. maybe I just thought she was credited because I just went to where I remembered her from and I found her. Anyway, yeah. this is Sienna Goines, mm-hmm. born 1969 in Washington, D.C. She only has about 50 acting credits so far, starting back in 95. And her longest running gig was actually 104 episodes of The Young and the Restless. But I totally recognize her from, like, five episodes of Jericho and, and three I, episodes of yeah. Criminal Minds. She is in my favorite arc of all of Criminal Minds, because yeah. it's the one that's Prentice-centric. Yeah. She has a very distinctive face with very pronounced cheeks. Yes. Like, once you've seen her in something, you will recognize her the next and time the you voice. see her. the voice. The voice is pretty distinctive. Yeah. But her face is definitely distinctive. Yes. Very much. Yeah. Anyway, she's staring at the man very intently. He has apparently been doing the speech standing because he stands back up after, like, starting to rewrite it and restarts the speech with some renewed energy. And it's about, like, working with your enemies to achieve greater goals. I wonder how that will play out this episode. Mm. Yeah, anyway, we hear clapping. And then we, we are shown the other side of the desk from the man, and we see a... A dude. A dude just appear. Yep. Right there. Right out and right in front of him. Yep. Yeah, dude with, like, uh, some Don Bluth hair and a leather jacket. It is shiny pleather. Oh, gosh. So, so, so dark and shiny. Yeah, and a big-ass ring with a red cabochon on it. Yeah, with with a a lovely dark gray sweater that I actually kind of liked the Mm -hmm. sweater. Yeah, we we won't learn that his name is Devlin for For a while. For a while, yeah. But Uh, might as well tell you about the actor now because, you know, he was also instantly recognizable to me. Though he does look an awful lot like uh, Seamus Dever from Castle. He's not, but they could totally be brothers. (sighs) Um, This actor is Anthony Stark, and that's Stark with an E at the end. Yeah, not to be confused with Tony Stark. Correct. He was born in 1963 in Syracuse, New York. He only has 60 acting credits so far, starting back in 1985. But I actually know him from his time on Make It or Break It, which is a TV show about teen gymnasts trying to make it to the Olympics. It's a weird show, but I have a guilty pleasure with watching things about gymnastics and cheerleading. Yeah, yeah, we've we've had this conversation. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm odd, but like dance teams. Yeah. I don't know why. It's just, it's a guilty pleasure for me, but, and I enjoy it. And so there's that. Um, and he was also, believe it or not, in Return of the Killer Tomatoes with a very young George Clooney. Oh dear. Oh man. Like just, oh, so young George Clooney. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the congressman asks who this guy is, what he wants. Devlin says he requires inspiration and he wants his muse. The woman behind the desk is surprised that she can be seen and then sees the ring on Devlin's finger. It is a silver ring with a very large red stone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like little cabochon, so it's like smooth. Stupid large. Mm-hmm. That's pretty big. Yeah. Um, she asks how he got the ring of inspiration. He's like, more important question, how will you get out of it? And then he like... 
He does the uh, the Green Lantern power yeah, fist. Yeah, he like shoves his fist toward her. And, 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 she, and gets she gets sucked in. Sucked up into the ring. Yeah. The congressman, of course, has no idea what's going on. He can't see the muse. He right. tries to run through the door and Devlin blinks in front of him. And when the congressman tries to beg, Devlin just grabs his face and sets him to burning. Yep. The congressman screams. We go to the opening credits. We find out there's no Daryl this episode. And Aww. I got very sad. The Netflix song that is playing. I, okay, so I had never heard of this band before, but now I want to listen to more of their stuff. Yeah. The Netflix song is a song called Beautiful by the Parlotones. They are a South African indie rock band that formed in 1998. It's like four white guys from South Africa. Yeah. Um, But it was such a good song. Like, I watched the music video for it, and the music video is fucking weird as hell. I bet. But the song was just really good. And so I'm like, okay, well, now I need to look up more of their stuff. Clearly. Because, like, for the first time in a long time, they've played a song where I was like, I need to know more. (laughs) So I, I am very excited about it. Cool. Anyway, we get shots of the Golden Gate Bridge, the Coit Tower, the Triangle Building, some other bridge that wasn't Golden Gate or Oakland Bay. Uh, and then we pan down through the tree with green leaves. A very windy, windswept tree. Yeah. To see the manor. Yeah. In the kitchen, Piper is on the phone with someone named Bev and making a cup of coffee out of the roundest carafe I have ever seen. Yeah, it kind of looked like it was about to explode. It looked like a teapot. Yeah, it was kind of bubbly. Uh, like like bubble Yeah. Yeah. It looked like a bubble. Yeah. It looked like like bubble boy. Yeah. But coffee. Yeah. Uh, anyway. She is in uh, dark beige pants and a light beige sleeveless top that has unfinished edges. It's at like the shoulders. more than unfinished. It's like a li- like halfway between unfinished and fringy. Yeah, it's it's, it's like, like that like weird frayed, middle ground. It's like a frayed edge. Uh huh. Yeah. That is is done on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like a good good like three quarter inch of that. Yeah, it was quite 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 big on all of the uh-huh. the edges there. And her hair is pulled half back into a twisted ponytail, and she's got that little diamond necklace on. And uh, as she as she takes her coffee toward the the kitchen table, Phoebe just breezes in and grabs the cup out of her hand. And we saw this was the last of the coffee out of that pot. Yeah, Phoebe is in white pants and a red tank top that has a bit of lace at the bust, with her hair in a curled up do with a white cloth headband thing tied in a bow. Yeah, we don't yet see the bottom of her pants, but they are interesting. Mm. We'll get to it. Yeah. Uh, Phoebe asks if Piper has seen Cole, and Piper's like, uh, yeah, he said something about running errands. Uh, Piper asks about their date, and Phoebe's like, oh my god, he just talked about factions the whole fucking time. Yeah. Piper says that it's easier for him to talk about demons than it is to talk about if she's going to consider his marriage proposal now that he's fully human. And Phoebe's like, yeah, I totally get that. But has he said something to you? Piper's like, no, sweetie. But his face looks like it. And, you know, relationships don't often survive a rejected proposal. And Phoebe's like, oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't rejected. It was postponed. Yeah. Piper's like, you need to talk to yeah. him. Yeah, you yeah, absolutely need to talk to him. Mm-hmm. Piper then gets up and says that she's leaving to go to P3. Phoebe questions why she's going to the club at 9 a.m. since, you know, club kids usually sleep in. Yeah. And Piper says that there is, quote, a corporate party big money total nightmare. Yep. Unquote. Piper leaves the kitchen and Phoebe follows, asking about a demon attack. And Piper wonders, oh, don't demons sleep in? Yeah. And they walk into the foyer. And now we can see that Phoebe's pants stop just below the knee with ruffles. They look like pantaloons. Uh Uh-huh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're supposed to be wearing these under a skirt with petticoats. Uh huh. It's kind of adorable. That's one way to say it. I like it. Mm. Like I wouldn't wear it, but I like it. Yeah. I think it's cute looking. Mm. Phoebe tells Piper what Cole said about the demons working together to take out the source. Piper seems keen on the idea of a dead source, and then she puts on a purple suede coat. I love that coat. I want that coat. Oh, yeah. Oh, 
Such a nice yeah. quote. Phoebe says that Cole seems to think that the best way for a faction leader to gain the support of the demonic masses would be to kill them. Yeah. And then Paige, Paige is coming down the stairs carrying a, a, a mostly box empty, of art supplies. A mostly empty box of art supplies. Yeah. Paige is in red pants that have a black stripe down the side and a low-cut white crop top with sleeves to the elbows. It's kind of like a sweater. With but an, like a light linen sweater. Mm, with an extra flap of fabric over the right breast. Her hair is down. And we have cute sister moment number one. Paige says, who's going to kill us? Piper says, no one. Paige then says, oh, that's new. Yeah. And then goes back upstairs. Yeah. She drops the stuff she's carrying on the table, goes back upstairs. Phoebe asks Piper about some sort of protection potion. And Piper says that if there was one, she'd already be putting it in the morning coffee. Mm-hmm. They're just going to have to do what they always do, which is wait for attack and then deal with it. Paige, Paige comes back down with a box of canvases this time. Yeah. We get a second get... cute sister moment. Who's attacking us? No one. Right on. I get the weekend off. Yeah. It was great. This time she drops the box under the table and goes back upstairs. How many takes of this did they do uh, where poor Rose had to just go up and down and up and down the stairs? Like, yeah. I get it when they have to do multiple takes of like, oh, maybe they're coming down the stairs saying a line, have to redo it. Or maybe multiple takes of them going up the stairs saying a line, have to redo that. But like, they had her going up. And, and down, down and, and up, up and down, down like four times. Yeah. Clearly. No, six times. No, well, five times, technically. This is why I say like, because yeah. I can be wrong, yeah. but not be wrong. Yeah. So, she they, got clearly, they clearly had some... This is way before Fitbit, sweetie. Yeah, I know. Uh, they clearly had someone waiting at the top of the stairs out of frame to just hand her the fucking box, because there's no way she got up the stairs to her room back to the stairs and then back down in the time that it clearly took her while filming. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Unless, yeah even she, then, even she then might she might have still staged the boxes at the, at the top stairs. of the thing. You all know. those fucking stairs. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Phoebe says that if Cole is right, they have no idea how many demons will be coming after them. Piper quips that she's starting to miss the source, which I thought was hilarious. Mm, give it a mo, Pipe. Yep. Phoebe pulls at Piper's heart by reminding her that Cole is human with no powers and living in a house that's constantly under demonic attack. So Piper gives in. She's like, I'll make something when I get back from the club. She says they can't afford to lose the income and her client is insisting on a last minute theme. She is not a fan of themes. No. Phoebe gets really excited because she's great at themes. The theme of her prom, Almost Paradise, was totally her idea. And so Piper's like, am I supposed to be impressed? And Paige comes down with another box. Piper and Phoebe wonder if she's moving out, but Paige says that she's just cleaning out her art stuff because she just doesn't have time for it anymore. Phoebe manages to rope Paige in on the theme thing because she's a creative type. Uh-huh. And as they walk to the door, we, we get... have cute sister moment number three. Number three. Us theme. You potion, says Phoebe. Me peeved. You annoying, says Piper. Me Tarzan. You Jane. <laughs> yep. Should say Paige. Hmm. Um... Uh, Phoebe and Paige grab their coats and rush out the door, leaving Piper in the foyer. It was so cute. This is this is my favorite scene of them being sisters mm-hmm. because it what it was just cute sister moment after cute sister moment, mm-hmm. and it was great, and yeah. I loved it. Yeah, we jump over to a older homeless man wandering down a nicely redressed alley. Mm-hmm. When I say nicely, I mean it looks like shit. Yep, as it should. Absolutely. Devlin and another warlock blink in in front of this dude, and as far as I can tell, this guy gets no name mentioned in the show, but IMDb lists the character as Jackson. Yeah, that was who I was figuring it was, too. Yeah, I had to do a Google search to find a picture to make sure that it was the right person, because he has no picture on IMDb. I did not do the Google search, but I was once I saw the name, I was like, yeah, he could be Hawaiian. Yeah. So, Chad Kukahiko... Yes. I practiced that one. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. He was born in 1972, somewhere in Hawaii. On the Big Island, I think it said. Yeah. But, like, it doesn't... Yeah. Yeah. This is his first of only three acting gigs. He's more of a writer, editor, director, producer, and assistant director in his credits. All of those are for TV shows, TV movies, and shorts. So, there's that. 
Yeah. Devlin's eyes glow red, and Homeless Man turns into a warlock. And this is played by Graham Shells. Shields. Uh, he was the Darklighter victim back in episode 311. I was wondering why he looked so fucking familiar. Uh-huh. I'm like, hang on. Bald dude, nice suit. Where are you from? Yep. He was on this show before. That's where he's uh-huh. from. The demon tells him to back Less off. Less than a season ago, too. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah, less than a season. The demon tells him to back off. Devlin's eyes change back to normal. And he mockingly says that the source would have killed them if he had killed a demon. Jackson compliments the demon's power of glamouring. And as the demon goes to leave, Devlin's like, oh, I just need to borrow your little trick. And then Jackson comes up and stabs the demon. Yeah. The demon dies in a puff of smoke and fire. And Jackson apparently receives his glamouring power. Because warlock. Right. Um, Devlin Devlin tells Jackson to use his new power to kill the Charmed Ones and bring their powers back to him. And Jackson is annoyed that Devlin is sending him to kill the Charmed Ones alone. Devlin is like, well, you know, I have limited time to recruit the others and gain more power. And Jackson wonders why he has to risk his life so that Devlin can become the source. Smart thinking warlock dude. Too bad it won't save your life. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because Devlin is a uh, slimy bastard. Yeah. And he's like, "Mm, he speechifies about something about being second class citizens using words that the congressman would have. Mm -hmm. And the warlock is like, well, what do I get from helping? Devlin says that he gets a little inspiration and then points the ring at Jackson. He is covered in a bright red light that makes him go up onto his tiptoes. And like lean his head back. Yeah. Devlin then tells him to get to work, and Jackson blinks out. We get an exterior shot of P3. No one is around, but but the the now-appearing sign is on the wall. wall. Why? Uh Why? Oh, man. Yeah. Phoebe, Paige, and a woman named Bev are there, sitting at the base of the stairs, three mineral waters with straws on the table. Not that I would really want to keep track, but a tally for that would be hilariously funny to me. Yeah. Just saying. Um, Well... Phoebe... Yeah. Yeah. Phoebe has added a long fitted denim jacket to her outfit, which is reminiscent of a jacket we have seen before, but that one had studs on the collar and this one doesn't. So that huh. tells me she has two long denim jackets. Long fitted denim jackets. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Very fitting for Phoebe. Yeah. Paige has added a green velvet jacket to her outfit, which was quite nice. Bev is played by Cindy Ambuel. Probably. Not, I'm not exactly her, sure how to say that one because it is Ambul. Yeah, spelled probably. spelled very interestingly. She was born in 1965 in Los Angeles, California. She has 55 acting credits between 1990 and 2016, and she looked vaguely familiar to me from her time on JAG. Cool. She's not really a that guy kind of thing, but like I looked at her and was like, I, I know her from something. What do I know her from? And it was JAG. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Remember, guy is not gender neutral. Yes. We had this conversation before. Yeah. Uh, Phoebe is trying to pitch Bev a 1940s theme. She mentioned zoot suits. Which, which were, were men's suits with high that were, were high-waisted, wide-legged, tight-cuffed peg trousers, and a long coat with wide lapels and wide padded shoulders. The jazz singer Cab Calloway was famous for wearing them. And a more recent uh, example of a zoot suit would be the musical episode of Buffy. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's, if I want, if I get to fucking do a musical, I want to do that episode, and I want to be that fucking character. Hell yeah. Because it would be rad. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, I loved that episode. I know, it's great. Now I want to rewatch that episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I have the, I have the, the book for it. I think it's right there. Um, yes. Yeah. Anyway, she mentions saddle shoes. Which are a low heel casual shoe with a plain toe, but a saddle shaped panel in like mid foot area. Mm. Rory Gilmore wore saddle shoes as part of her school uniform. Oh, yeah, Gilmore yeah, yeah. Girls. Yeah, and then she mentions patriotism because most of World War II happened during the 1940s. Mm-hmm. And Beth is like, well, weren't the 50s a bit more flashy? And Paige says something extremely derisive. Yeah, she's like, yeah, but, you know, that's a theme that's been done a million times. And at the time of this episode, it had. Yeah. Like, the 40s weren't that popular in pop because culture. Because the 1950s in... was, you know, like, poodle skirts and mm-hmm. the beginning of that stuff. And yeah. Like, that's the thing, you know. Yeah, I remember doing that a ton in, like, elementary school. Yeah. Bev seems a little upset by Paige's words, but <laughs> Phoebe smooths things over by saying that Bev's 
era is the 40s because she has a Veronica Lake thing going on motioning to her hair. Now, Veronica Lake was an American film stage and TV actress. She was born in 1922 and her birth name is Constance Frances Marine Ackelman. Just let that sink in for a moment. Mm-hmm. It's a mouthful. Yeah, it's no wonder she changed her name. She died in 1973, and she has a, a star on the Hollywood uh, Walk of Fame. So yeah. there you go. Her signature hairdo was a peekaboo style, but she wound up changing it during the war at the urging of the government to encourage other women to go for more practical and safe hairdos since they were now working in the factories. It is thought that this may have contributed to, in, you know, have been a contributing factor to the decline of her acting career, though it also could have been the role that she took as a Nazi sympathizer in the Ugh. 1944 movie The Hour Before Dawn, or, you know, her alcoholism. We'll never know. Nope. Yeah. Uh, Beth touches her hair. She seems to be very flattered by the comment, and Paige is like, you need to go shopping. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe hands Bev the number for a costume shop, telling her to tell all of her friends to dress there or be square. Which is, of course, a play on the idiom, be there or be square, wherein the word square means uncool or boring. Yeah. Bev <sighs> laughs, thanks them, and then leaves. And Phoebe breathes a sigh of relief. She and Paige get ready to go as Cole walks down the stairs toward them. He is now in a green sweater under a tan jacket with black pants. Phoebe calls him Mr. Sneak Out of Bed, which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, he tells her he had stuff to do. She goes to hug him and then feels something under his shirt. And he just lifts up the sweater to, to show, you know, a white shirt tucked into his pants. Oh, and, and a, a gun. gun. It's I'm like not, a big gun, too. It's yeah, like a I'm magnum. Not, I'm not sure what kind of gun it was, but I'm fairly certain it was some sort of 9 millimeter pistol, judging by the barrel size. It was big. Yeah. The girls gasp. They freak about it. They freak out about the gun, and they tell him to get rid of it. And Cole is like, you've seen worse than this every day, as he just fucking waves the thing around. Phoebe replies they've seen demons every day, and there's a huge difference. Yeah. Which, you know, there is. He, of course, asks what kind of difference, and Paige says that they aren't likely to accidentally vanquish themselves. True. Phoebe asks where he got it, and Cole says that while he might not be a demon anymore, he still knows where the bad guys are. Paige asks if he can find them and give it back, which and, was great. Yeah, and Cole says he needs to protect himself and the ones he loves, and Phoebe's like, I am not living in a house with a gun. That makes things more dangerous, not less. And this has become our gun control episode, and I'm okay with it. Because she's not fucking wrong. No, she's not fucking wrong. I have a Foyd card. I will never own a gun. That is the one thing. And, like, whenever my cousin comes over and she has her gun, it stays in its holster. And if it if it has to stay in the house because we're going someplace where we can't bring the gun, then it gets put in the holster inside a box underneath my bed where nobody goes. Yep. <laughs> because, no. And as soon as we get where we're going and, and we get back from where we were going, she takes the gun back because I don't want it in my house. Nope. Nope. Anyway. I, I personally would have the added safety precaution of just unloading it well like i mean yes like just that, taking out the, the yeah. magazine and like sticking it in the box with it and yes. under the bed yes absolutely i believe though that like when it when it's in its proper box it actually is in there unloaded, uh -huh. so all is good. yeah anyway yeah like my dad has a safe that's in his car where he puts his gun when he's traveling right because like he has a he has a permit mm-hmm not sure what kind. Concealed carry? I have no idea. Um, probably if he's if he's able to have it in, in the car that way, then mm -hmm. yeah, probably. But yeah, like, I've seen it once, and I was like, no, no, I don't want to see this again. Please mm -hmm. keep it in your car and never show it to me. Yeah. I mean, Do not I, want. I enjoy going shooting. It's, it's, it's cathartic in a way. Um, I feel the same way about watching pimple popping videos. Yes, yeah, I can't do that. Um, but like... I don't really, it's really funny. I don't enjoy shooting the handgun as much as I enjoy shooting the rifle. That's got a kick. Um, it actually doesn't because I only shoot twenty two. Oh, okay. So it's it's not a very bad kick at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoy shooting the, the rifle because that, that to me feels much more like something that I might actually do, whatever, where it's the like, you know out there shooting squirrels or deer or whatever. Like, that's a hunting thing. Yeah. Whereas a pistol is much more, what are you shooting at? It's probably not an animal. Yeah. 
And that that has always felt a little weird to me. So I don't mind the hunting thing nearly as much. Yeah. And I also know that if I were to actually go hunting, it would be with somebody who would use all of the parts of the animal that we kill. And so I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. But I don't own a gun and I never will. Yeah. I don't plan on it either. Yeah. I could go for some fancy knives. I was going to say, though, if you ever want to go shooting, you just let me know. Yeah, loud noises in me don't get along very yeah. well, so I probably won't. I get that. Also, the taste of gunpowder in your mouth is... Yeah. Because it, it gets in the air. Well, also, like, I don't even like feedback on game controllers. <laughs> like, I had a very bad experience at Disney Quest with that once. Hmm. Like, back when Disney Quest was a thing. Yeah. For, like, that two-year span. Mm -hmm. Like, I legitimately cried because I'm like, this thing is vibrating. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And it was just sensory sensory overload from there. So, like, I couldn't handle that. I cannot handle the kickback on a gun. I know. Like I said, if it's a 22, there isn't much kickback. So it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Yes, but it's going to be more than a game controller. Mm. It's going to be more than a game controller vibrating. I can guarantee you that. Like actually, it, it, not so much because a game controller vibrating vibrates continuously. True, and but the they also have only like, happens when you shoot. Well, yeah, but like there's the there's the short vibration thingy on the. All I'm saying is that I know I won't be able to handle it, so I won't be doing it, and that's fine. I'm not trying to force you, mm-hmm. but the offer is there. Anyway, I would much rather get a combat lightsaber. Well, already then, they're cool. You can have sword fights with people. Have, Glowy sword fights. Have you seen the, the custom lightsaber website where you can make your own? I know. I know. They mm. they, they come to conventions. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, back to the show. Leo orbs in <laughs> wearing a long sleeve red polo shirt and jeans that are pooling at his ankles. Them need to be hemmed. Who? Who? Put, see, see the reboot costume department. Would never do this. Has has great like costumes. What happened? Why why is he wearing jeans that are so fucking long on him? I'm a no no. <sighs> yeah, Phoebe tells him he like he orbs in like slightly above them on the stairs too. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and Phoebe tells him that which is why I noticed the bottom of the jeans. Yeah, yeah. Phoebe tells him that Piper's back in the house. He's like, yeah, I just talked to her. I came to find you. Cole's like, oh, was there an attack? And Leo's like, kind of. But anyway, I've been hearing that muses have been disappearing and the elders are concerned. Paige is amazed that muses are real. Leo says that only a powerful evil can find a way to hurt a muse. Cole then mentions the factions. And we see the warlock from earlier, Jackson, blink in nearby and watch them. Yeah, he's like in that back room with the the payphone. Yeah. Phoebe says they should get back and Paige asks about 40's night. Phoebe says that they can call the decorator from the car, and Leo says he'll find out what he can and meet them at home. Phoebe stops him, mid-orb, grabs Cole's gun from out of his hand. There's a small protest from Cole. Yeah, and gives, like, she's holding it by the trigger guard. Yeah. And she hands it to Leo and asks him to orb it to Daryl. Phoebe and Paige leave, Paige shaking her head at Cole as she goes. Leo looks at Cole, and it's like, I won't even ask. And then Cole leaves. Leo looks at the gun, shakes his head, and orbs out. And then the warlock turns into Leo and blinks out. And I love the look that Brian Krause is giving as he's this warlock right here. Mm -hmm. Because it looks like a very evil look, even though it's just like a bare second of visual time. He's not even really moving. It's just like, great on you, Brian. Great on you. Yeah, he did a very good job Mm -hmm. with that, that subtle evil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we time jump over to Piper, who's in the attic at the manor. She's looking at a muses page in the Book of Shadows as Phoebe and Paige walk in. Now, this page, also a little bit Art Nouveau. Mm. I enjoy it. Yeah. It looked like that that one guy. Yep. What's his name? Toulouse Lautrec? No. Mm. No, that's a different thing. Um, You know the little, little, little something. I think it starts with an L. Um, I'm not positive. You know the guy, though. He did, like, the Probably. green fairy poster and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Like the Four Seasons or whatever. Yeah. I think I've mentioned him before. Yeah, I think you have. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, famous anyway. artist, did a lot of Art Nouveau shit. Right. Um, 
which was the period of time before Art Deco became popular. I, anyway. I enjoy good Art Deco, though. Mm-hmm. True, mm-hmm. true. Uh, Phoebe asks how the protection potion is going, and Piper's like, oh, it doesn't exist. Phoebe says they kept up their end of the deal, and Piper's like, yeah, Bev called. She is thrilled, but I thought that I should maybe focus on the muses. Mm-hmm. Paige then reads from the book that muses are, quote, beings of pure light whose sole purpose <laughs> is to inspire people's passion and creativity. Like angels, they guide us with an unseen hand of inspiration, unquote. And there are so many typos. Yeah. For instance, soul is S-O-U-L. Mm-hmm. And whose, is, like in the book, I believe was actually W-H-O apostrophe S. Instead of, and huh. like, yeah, it, it was, it was weird. Um, yeah. Although that's only two. Well, I think, I think White Lighter was also like, huh. So there was a, there was a few typos handwritten into the book. It was just interesting. Yeah. Whatever. Anyway. anyway uh, Phoebe wonders how evil can hurt someone who's invisible. And then we see a muse appear on the other side of the attic. This one is absolutely wearing a light blue dress, which is why I wasn't sure if the other one was supposed to be light blue. Uh, though this dress looks like a sheet that has been just draped over her. You know, like she's going to a toga party. Yeah. It is, it is a pin it. A toga-esque dress. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, if it's supposed to be Greek muses, it kind of makes sense. fucking great. Yeah, it doesn't look bad on her. It's, it's very Mm -hmm. nice. Uh, we will learn the muses name in just a moment. So let me quickly tell you about the actress. Siobhan Flynn has 36 acting credits so far, starting back in 1996, mostly TV shows. That's it. But can I just tell you that Siobhan, I looked at that name, S-I-O-B-H-A-N, and immediately knew how to say it. Yeah. I've known Siobhan's before. It's an Irish name. Mm Mm-hmm. But you know why I knew knew immediately how to say it? Nope. Because of the Sarah Michelle Gellar uh, TV show where she played twins and one of them was Siobhan. Oh. That is literally the reason. Mm. No, I had a... Because looking at that, there is no way that I would not have read that as, like, Cioban. I have no idea how to say that. Look, but uh, Gaelic and Welsh mm-hmm. are not languages that are supposed to be written with English letters. Yeah. But they are. Yeah. French, too, honestly. Yeah. If we're being perfectly real. Yeah. Basically, they just tried to make it have... Some kind of sense, which is why, like, once you learn the rules for pronouncing Welsh, it does kind of make sense because you're like, right. oh, well, they needed to have this sound, but that was already taken by this letter, so uh, let's add a letter. Yeah. Which is why Welsh looks the way it does, which frankly is insane. Uh huh. But hey, if you're Welsh, it's just like, we that's, know how it sounds. Yep, that's, that's it how looks it looks weirder do. than it sounds, honestly. Yep. But I'm very proud of myself for the fact that I needed no help with the name Siobhan. Just, I'm very I'm just proud putting of you. that out. Uh-huh. I, I had to, to practice saying the Hawaiian name, but this one I knew on sight. Yeah. And I'm proud of myself. Mm-hmm. Well, also, I'm, I don't know if she's Australian, but she's speaking with an Australian accent in this, and I kind of enjoyed it. Mm. Because you never get an Australian accent on this show. Mm. Just made me know. happy. It was it was definitely some sort of accent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Piper replies uh, that a good place to figure out how evil can hurt a muse is to ask a muse, but she can't figure out how to summon one. Apparently there's not a spell for it in the book. Phoebe then senses something and starts looking around the attic. And walking around the attic, and they move the green screen windy bit of Siobhan back and forth, and her eye line is completely in the wrong place. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. When Piper questions her, Phoebe says that she thinks there's a muse in the room. And then the muse, quote-unquote, touches Phoebe's shoulder, and Phoebe recites a spell off the cuff. Being of creativity, show yourself now to me. Your light that shines upon our face, let our vision now embrace. Very cute. Hmm. The muse then becomes visible, saying that she was hoping she could inspire Phoebe to say the spell, and introduces herself as Melody. Uh huh. And this is where we have that she has a very lovely accent. I'm very happy they let her use the accent. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was her actual accent or one she was putting on, but either way, I enjoyed it. It it sounded pretty natural. I don't know. It didn't sound fake. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Although honestly, like 
Sometimes I've heard an actor's accent on a show and been like, that's totally fake. And it was real. Yeah, true. Like, like Bella on Supernatural, with the one who was then on Walking Dead. Okay. Um, she was, like, the first person we see who, like, made a Crossroads deal or whatever, like, back in season three or whatever. Yeah, it's been um, a very long time. It, there have been so many the seasons one who of likes, Supernatural. The one who that, likes you know. sleeping uh, naked, rolling in money. Sure. Okay, anyway. Um, it's that bit with, like, the, the lucky the lucky rabbit foot or whatever. Like I said, there I, have been I, so many seasons of Supernatural. I know, but anyway, I heard her accent, and I was like, oh, that God, that sounds so fake. The actress is British. And then I hear her on Walking Dead, and she's got a southern accent, and it sounds perfectly fine. But apparently, British people are really good at doing southern accents. Because right. Andrew Lincoln, also on Walking Dead... Just sounds really southern on yeah. there. Because because a southern accent is closer to what a British accent used to be. True. So yeah. hmm It's all it's all the drawn out O's. The drawn out vowels. Yeah. It just you know, it just works. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Anyway. Uh Phoebe starts to introduce everyone, but Melody's like, Oh, I know who you are. I've been inspiring you your whole lives. She then asks for their help. Paige realizes that Melody knows what's happening. And Melody says that she and another muse were inspiring a symphony when the friend was captured. She says she was lucky to get away from a warlock wearing the Ring of Inspiration, which she says is a ring that enables the wearer to see and capture muses. Bad design, guys. Mm, Yep. She says that it was created by good magic to channel inspiration in times of great need. Yeah, because, you know, we need... We need tons of inspiration. Let's just suck some muses into a ring for a while. Yeah. Instead of making some sort of something that just brings a lot of muses to you. Yeah. You're just going to capture them. Yeah, like you effectively made an evil Pokeball. Uh Uh-huh. And that's saying something. Yeah. Because Pokeballs are not that ethically sound when you think about it. Yeah. Like, uh, supposedly the environment inside of them, once the... The Pokemon gets in is fine, like, exactly what they need, but, like, we never see that shit. Yeah. Like, Ash doesn't get turned into a fucking Pokemon and get sucked up into a Pokeball. We don't have, like, a, oh, no, I'm a genie now type thing where suddenly you see the inside of the bottle. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway. Anyway. Paige asks if a warlock is like a demon. Piper says, pretty Pretty much, much, yeah. yeah. And Paige just replies, that's nice. (laughs) It was cute. And then Jackson, wearing his Leo costume, comes sauntering in. Phoebe questions his not orbing in, and Paige introduces Melody. And at the same time as Leo Jackson says, nice to meet you, Melody says, we go way back. Which makes Piper take notice, which I love that Piper is the one that noticed it. Yeah. Jackson tries to save face. By pretending he forgot and saying it's good to see her again, and Melody looks a little sad. Yeah, a little crestfallen. Just, just a, just a titch. Uh huh. She, she looked a little bit like someone who'd just been told by her crush that they don't exist. Yeah. You know, just, just a little bit. Yeah. Phoebe asks if Leo's ever heard of the Ring of Inspiration, and Leo Jackson says, in actually kind of a Leo type way, uh, yeah, I think so, Red Jewel. Yeah. Piper's like, uh, you should have mentioned that earlier, and she does super suspicious eyes. Yeah. Jackson then apologizes and hides his hand behind his back, and then a rather large knife appears in his hand. (laughs) Piper gives him some side eye and then calls out for Leo. Jackson goes, what, as actual Leo orbs in behind Piper. It was really funny the way Brian Krause said what. Like, yeah. like he was trying to cover up someone else saying something, mm-hmm. which he, granted he kind of was, but not in yeah in the like it's like what oh, I'm right here. Some, it kind of it it felt more like oh I've stuffed him in a trunk back there and I, you can't hear him answer, so I have to be slightly louder about it. But no, not so much. Yeah. So Jackson grabs Phoebe, stabs her in the back, and then blinks out. Leo and Piper run over to Phoebe as Cole runs in. Jackson blinks behind Paige. Cole yells out to warn her. She yelps and orbs out. Jackson then drops the glamour, looking confused, just before Piper blows him up. Leo then heals Phoebe. Piper asks if she's okay. Phoebe nods and Paige orbs back in. Paige asks what that was. Cole says it was a warlock. 
Piper asks Melody if he was the warlock who captured her friend, and she she's says, like, no. No. Phoebe says they must be working together, and Cole is overly satisfied that his warning about factions has come true, and uh, we go into commercial huh. break. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He is He is. Well, it, the, the, way was, the way these satisfied. lines are structured, it's like, what was that? That was a warlock. And that, my friends, is a faction. Mm-hmm. We come back from the commercial break a short time later with everyone coming down the stairs. Phoebe says they have to make a plan. Piper says she has a plan to cook up a potion that she can practically taste. She says that she doesn't know what it does, but it tastes pretty good. Mm -hmm. Paige laments that she almost threw away all of her painting stuff. And Phoebe says she keeps hearing the rhyming of a vanquishing spell in her mind. She needs to write it down. She then turns to Melody, asking if she's doing it. Melody says that Phoebe is doing it. She's just helping it come out. Yeah, Phoebe rhymes her response, and Melody realizes she's been in one place too long, and inspiration gets a little little intense when she does that. Piper says that they need all the help they can get, so intense could be good, and Paige says that she thinks she knows how to get the ring. She asks Melody to describe the warlock so she can draw him, and Cole says that Leo should orb him underground. Phoebe is confused and concerned, but Cole says that he knows the terrain even if he doesn't have powers anymore. She's still rhyming her answers. Piper reminds Cole that he'd be a sitting duck without his powers. And that makes our second idiom of the episode, I believe. A sitting duck is something that is unprotected and vulnerable. And sitting ducks is actually one of my favorite pieces of random art. (laughs) It was done by Michael Bettard in 1977, and it shows three ducks lounging in poolside chairs, and one of them is glancing up to notice two bullet holes on the wall behind him. Cole says he's a sitting duck already, and walks over to Piper, like he's in a really bad western movie. He puts his hand on Piper's shoulder and says he's just trying to be useful. She pushes his hand away. Slaps as, it, really. Yeah, as Phoebe says that Cole is useful alive, so he needs to be the brains and not the brawn. Cole ain't good at that. Mm. Cole asks if there's a rule that makes him choose, and Phoebe rhymes that she could make one up, but it would just be a ruse. Melody fails to get a word in. Yeah. Paige says that Cole has a point since he's a demon. Phoebe reminds her that he was a demon, and Melody tries to interject again. Paige says he was a half-demon who knows his way around the underground, and they need all the help they can get. Melody tries to get Leo to help her out. Leo starts to interject, but Phoebe says that the only reason that the bounty hunters have stopped coming around is because they think Balthazar, think Cole, is dead, so he shouldn't go underground. Cole, whose voice has also gone the way of the bad Western movie, yells that he's still there. Piper reminds Cole that he If he gets caught, he'd have no way to defend himself. Phoebe asks if he has some sort of death wish. And Cole replies, Phoebe won't be happy until he puts on an apron and becomes her houseboy. Now, the term houseboy has a few versions. One was a British Empire term for a male housekeeper. Usually, but not always, they were an ethnic minority and worked for a British family in a British colony. Another is a military slang term from World War II, where the native boy would help a soldier perform basic domestic duties, like cleaning, laundry, ironing, shoe shining, that sort of thing. It's also got context in the gay community. Yeah, where cleaning can have a sexual or erotic aspect. Mostly just because they're just wearing an apron. Yeah. Anyway... Leo finally gets the chance to tell everyone that passions tend to run high when there's a muse around, and they need to keep that in mind when they're communicating with each other. Piper tells Phoebe to write her spell, tells Paige to do whatever she was going to do, tells Cole to join her to help figure out what she needs to go into her potion, and then she heads toward the kitchen. Paige grabs her art stuff, goes upstairs. Cole tells Phoebe they'll talk later. He starts to walk off, and she instantly replies with alligator. Yeah, which is from our third idiom, uh, which would be, see you later, alligator, which just means goodbye, and is sometimes replied to with, after a while, crocodile. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, uh, he is slightly annoyed, but tams it down and goes back when Piper calls for him. He heads off, Phoebe goes upstairs, Melody looks at Leo, and then Leo heads for the kitchen as well. We get to the kitchen, where Piper somehow already has eight pots boiling. Eight, eight pots. Just think about that. Yeah. There's four on the main stove and four in the middle uh, on the on the countertop stove. On the island stove. Eight pots. And they're, like, they're doing that dry ice 
boiling thing. Yeah, they are already boiling and smoking. Yeah. And just eight yeah. of them all yeah. at once. Piper doesn't Ooh. understand why a warlock would want the ring, and Cole says that Muse's inspiration is like a power surge or an overdose of adrenaline, and then asks Piper to work fast because he knows they'll be back. Piper says she's making it up as she goes, so he's going to have to be patient. Mm-hmm. She then says that he also has to be patient with Phoebe on the marriage thing. And Cole Cole's says, like, that's none of your business. And Leo's like, well, you, you don't know sisters. You don't know sisters, do you? Yeah. Piper says that Cole is struggling to figure out how to be a new person. Cole says that he thought that they were going to talk about warlocks. Leo shakes his head. Mm. Piper says that Phoebe is also trying to figure out how to be a new person. She says that Phoebe was always the youngest sister, the eternal child, and she got to be carefree and fun-loving. Cole's like, where the hell is this going? Leo reminds him that in a very short period of time, she lost Prue, discovered Paige, and became the middle sister. Piper then mentions that his proposal terrified Phoebe because she isn't ready to be that much of a grown-up. Cole asks if Phoebe said that to her. Piper's like, no, no, but I'm her big sister. I just know. And then she turns back to the stove. Cole asks Leo for a word, and they leave the kitchen. Piper then puts something in one of the pots, and it explodes. And she is very excited that the patience has paid off. But when she turns around to show off to the boys, she's alone. <laughs> yep, it was adorable. Mm-hmm. We cut to the conservatory, our lovely wicker room, where Cole is asking Leo for a favor. Leo thinks that it's Cole wanting him to talk to Phoebe, but Cole's like, no, no, orb me underground, please. Leo warns him that that's just the inspiration talking and says that the only plan they have right now is to draw the warlock. Leo says that he trusts the Charmed Ones to know what they're doing, and Cole says he thinks the warlock was using demonic powers. Leo realizes that he had to have killed a demon to get those powers, and we learn that there are laws against warlocks killing demons, which is apparently punishable by death. As most things are, I imagine, in demonic court. Right. Uh, Cole says that he knows where demons would go to discuss treason, and all they'd have to do is listen to find out which warlock is behind it. Leo mentions that they have to be unseen, and Cole says that if they go now, they can be back before anyone notices. Sure. Leo's like, yeah, no, they're going to notice, and they're going to be pissed at me. And then he orbs out with Cole. Yeah. I don't know why, but that moment was just like, it was it was a lovely moment where Leo was just like, they're going to be mad, but I know that this really should be done. All right, let's do this and try not to die. You know? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. great. We cut to the attic where Phoebe, Paige, and Melody are hanging out. Paige is drawing the demon while Phoebe reads what she's written. And now... The posture that Rose has holding this pencil is very much, I am writing something down. I am writing words. That's what her fingers look like. Right, but she's supposedly drawing. She's supposedly drawing. Yeah, but she was But, doing... like, none of the movements she's doing, her her hand is just hanging out on one side of this giant page. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely not a drawing posture. It was a writing posture. Yeah. And uh, the spell that Phoebe has apparently written down goes thusly. A warlock is a funny thing. He blinks from place to place. And when we say these words to him, his face they will erase. That's not exactly what you're going for, Phoebes. I love it more than I probably should. It's adorable. I love it so much. Paige says that it sounds more like a limerick than a spell. Melody compliments Paige's drawing. Paige says it's thanks to her. And Melody says that she has no control over the product. She only gives the inspiration to create Phoebe asks for some, so Melody walks over to her and tells Phoebe to close her eyes and concentrate. They both close their eyes, and a few seconds later, Phoebe thanks her. Melody walks back over to Paige, asking why she stopped painting, meaning in general, not in this moment. And Paige asks why she stopped inspiring her to paint. Melody tells her she has no control over the will to paint, but that Paige stopped painting because she stopped caring about the art. Paige says that she didn't stop caring, but that she's a perfectionist and stopped when she didn't have time to practice anymore. Melody tells her that art isn't about perfection. It's about expression. All she has to do is love it. And then Piper walks in with vials of green potion, asking if Phoebe has a spell. Like a nice foresty green, too. Mm. It's deep. It was a dark, yeah, deep, dark, deep, dark. Yeah. It was a deep green potion. Mm -hmm. Phoebe clears her throat and recites, Evil is a faithful foe, but good does battle best. We witches will, with these words, waste the warlock's evil zest. 
Piper replies, wonderful, witty, but wordy. Phoebe scoffs and hands a copy of the spell to Piper and Paige. Phoebe then looks at the drawing. Impressed with Paige's work, it is a very nice pencil sketch of Devlin. Yeah, it's a really, really good sketch. And it was very clearly not done by Rose. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. It looked like you could have made this in Photoshop, possibly, mm. if you just had, like, an extremely well-lit photo of this guy. Yeah. You could posterize it and then turn it into, like, a sketchy bit. Yeah, but it was it was a nice it was a nice pencil sketch of him with his arms crossed showing the ring... Mm-hmm. Paige says that she thinks she can call for the ring now that she has a focus, which will make him have to come to get the ring back. Yes. Paper mentions that the potion will flash in the warlock's eyes, making him not be able to blink. Paige asks what that is. And Phoebe's like, oh, that's how they get around. Paige is like, well, why doesn't Piper just freeze him or blow him up? Piper's Piper, like, yeah, sometimes that doesn't work. Yeah, sometimes it just, you know, they don't freeze Mm -hmm. or blow up and a power of three spell is the only guarantee this seems to satisfy Paige. they all clink their bottles together and then phoebe's like we should tell the guys piper asks why melody smiles and phoebe goes to the attic door and calls out for cole but there is no answer phoebe looks back at her sisters and then we find ourselves in the underground as Leo and Cole are crouching behind a rock, spying on a meeting going on nearby. Very nearby. So very, very nearby. Like, legitimately, there's maybe ten feet of corridor around a corner, and they're staring straight fucking into the room. Yep. With just a rock or two in front of them. Uh Uh-huh. As cover. And there's a lot of hallway behind them. Uh Uh-huh. Leo asks where they are. Cole says it's the High Council meeting quarters, and then a demon comes up behind them and asks if they're lost. Cole calls him Rake, so let me tell you about him right quick. This actor has got to have my favorite name so far. Harley Zumbrum. I don't know why. I just love it. Zumbrum. Mm -hmm. He has no picture on IMDb and only has 30 acting credits between 1995 and 2006, almost all of which were single episodes of TV shows. He was on an episode of Buffy and an episode of Gilmore Girls, but, you know, that's it. Yeah, he's like a bouncer type. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Big burly dude. Mm Mm-hmm. Rake recognizes Cole as Balthazar when he very sheepishly, like, shows his face, apologizes for thinking he was a warlock, and starts to walk away. He then stops, mentions that he heard Balthazar was dead, and, and Cole's, Cole's like, like oh, yeah. yeah, I kind of have to stay that way. And then he walks over and stabs Rake. Yeah. Rake goes up in flame. Leo says that he seemed like a friend, and Cole's like, yeah, he was in my old life. And Leo asks if it's different You know, if it feels different, killing as a human. Cole ignores this and just tells him to keep an eye out, and they go back to watching the meeting in full view of said meeting. Right, and then Leo turns to also watch the meeting, so he's doing a poor job of keeping an eye out. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. We cut back to the attic, where Piper is calling out for Leo. Phoebe walks in, saying that Cole isn't in the house. Piper mentions that Leo isn't answering her call, and Phoebe is pissed that they would do this. Paige asks what they did, and then Piper mentions that the only reason Leo wouldn't hear her call is if he was underground with Cole. Paige says she'd rather do battle with warlocks than with them. Meaning her sisters. Yes. Phoebe then tells Paige to call for the ring. Paige asks if they shouldn't wait for Leo, but Phoebe tells her to just do it. Paige stands in front of her drawing and calls for ring. Nothing happens. Melody tells her to breathe and focus, and they all close their eyes. We cut to Devlin, transitioning very nicely via the drawing. Mm -hmm. He's with another warlock who, again, gets no name on the show, but is called Hector on IMDb. Jorge Luis Paolo has 71 acting credits so far, starting back in 1997. He's mostly done single episodes of TV shows, but he did have a 17-episode run on The Secret Life of an American Teenager back in 2008-2009 and was on three episodes of American Horror Story back in 2017. So people might recognize him from those. Yeah. Hector is impressed by the power of the ring. Devlin asks what power he got, and an energy ball appears in Hector's hand. Devlin holds his hand over it. Lovingly, lovingly caressing, caressing it, it like a tiny guinea pig mm-hmm. and then suddenly his ring orbs out 
We cut to the attic where the ring orbs in onto the table. Paige is very excited that it worked, and Phoebe tells her to get the muses out. We cut back to Devlin and Hector, where Hector notices that the ring is missing before Devlin does, but Devlin knows that the Charmed Ones have to be the reason that it's gone. He says that they're going to get it back. Hector replies that they vanquished the last sucker Devlin sent in. Devlin says, oh, he didn't have this newly acquired power, and asks if he wants to live in the shadow of other demons his whole life. Hector refuses, saying that it's suicide, but Devlin tells him that the Charmed Ones aren't expecting the two of them, so they can totally take them out, take their powers, and rule the underworld together. Sure, honey. Yeah. Hector buys it, and then blinks out, and a moment later, Devlin blinks out, after giving this knowing smile. We cut to the attic, where the girls are hiding behind some random luggage. As you do. As you do. Hector blinks in, the girls all throw their potions, and say All of them. All of them. All three. All of them. All of the bottles. All of them. All of the potions. They throw the potion and say the spell disjointedly, I might add. Mm -hmm. Hector is vanquished in a burst of flame, and the second the smoke clears, Devlin blinks in, grabs the ring, and blinks out. Piper is confused. Devlin blinks back in, sitting high atop some stuff. Phoebe cries out as he sucks Melody into the ring. Phoebe tells Piper to blow him up. Paige says, no, no, you might blow up Melody too. And Devlin blinks back out, and we go to commercial break. All three of them yeah. through the potion. Yeah. I, it's been a long time since I've thought the girls were being stupid. Yeah. I mean, they know he's been working with other warlocks. They just met one of them. Uh-huh. They cannot possibly assume that he'd come alone. Uh-huh. And, like, they, yeah. they know what he looks like because they have the image of what he looks like. The dude who blinked in first did not look anything remotely like him. Nope. Why? Why? Just why? why? When we come back, we are in the attic. Piper, Phoebe, and Paige are all sitting around the table doing nothing. Leah orbs in with Cole, who tells them that they found out that the faction leader is a warlock named Devlin. Phoebe remarks that he looked more like a Joe. Leo asks where Melody is. Paige says that she's gone. And Piper clarifies that she was sucked into Devlin's big bad ring. Big red ring. It's also bad. Mm -hmm. Leo asks what they're doing now, and Phoebe's like, we're basking in the brilliance of our failure. Cole asks what happened. Paige says she called for the ring and released the muses. Piper says that it was useless, though, due to Devlin showing back up and taking it. You know, so he's just going to capture them all again. Phoebe states the irony that he took their muse and is going to use her inspiration to kill them. Mm hmm Leo says that he understands that they are, you know, wiped out after their inspiration binge, but reminds them that they can't give up. Cole says that Devlin will be back and be stronger. Paige says they have no inspiration to fight him. Leo reminds her that Melody just inspired their own passion, creativity, and talent, so they just need a, to find another way to tap into it. Piper immediately suggests heading for the hills. Cole jokes that it rhymes with kills, and Phoebe gets pissy about him rhyming. And thinking that that's funny. Yeah. Saying that if he had just stayed in the house, he might have been able to help. Cole, of course, wonders how, since she would have just sent him to his room when Devlin showed up. She says she wasn't just being a nagging girlfriend, she was trying to keep him alive. He's like, I understand you not wanting to marry me because I can't defend myself. She's upset that that's what he thinks. He says that he has a hard time believing a woman who's truly in love would turn down a marriage proposal. Phoebe and I say that that's how little he knows about women. And then goes on to remind him that there's still so much they don't know about each other. There's a little bit of back and forth with Jen's with Phoebe saying the only thing she knows for sure is that she truly loves him, but she doesn't know how to be a wife. He kisses her. And she says that she can't live without him in her life. They kiss again. Paige and Piper realize she just rhymed. And Leo says, yeah, Phoebe's passion for Cole is a natural way to access inspiration. Phoebe and Cole stop kissing. Phoebe goes over to Piper and Paige and gives them a little pep talk. Paige and Piper aren't really feeling it and want to run. But Cole says that they can't run if Devlin has the ring. Phoebe continues to try, you know, using her pep talk thing. It involves more rhyming. Piper calls her Dr. Seuss. And I I love the fact that I kind of knew this, but I had to look it up. Theodore Soisgeisel 
was born in 1904 and died in 1991. He was an American children's author, political cartoonist, and animator. He published over 60 books, mostly written in Anapestic Tetrameter, uh, which have sold over 600 million copies and have been translated into over 20 languages. He is responsible for such classics as Horton Hears a Who, The Cat in the Hat, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and Green Eggs and Ham. The name Dr. Seuss became his pen name and pronounced that way because he wanted the pronunciation to be associated with Mother Goose and because, you know, most people were already pronouncing it that way. And he added doctor because his father wanted him to practice medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, little things. I'm also going to link to the wiki for Yertle the Turtle because it's the story that most relates to this episode since it's basically about the rise and fall of Hitler. (gasps) Fun! Yeah. It was also... Uh, the first children's book to include the word burp. So that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was never one to shy away from inspiration, that Dr. Seuss. Yeah, even mm-hmm. when it was uh, pretty racist. Yeah. But, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was of the time. <laughs> anyway, Paige wonders if they shouldn't wait for Devlin to come back, but should go to him. Phoebe's excited that she's up for it, says they're going to need a new spell and more potion. I do wonder why they just can't reuse the same spell, but okay. Uh, They do, as we recall. Spoiler alert! Piper says that she can't remember what she put in the potion, and Leo says, oh, he and Cole might be able to help. They were there. Piper's like, there were like 15,000 herbs on that counter. And there were. There really were. Yeah, there were a ton. A ton of herbs. Phoebe tells her to just start cooking and let that inspire her. Piper then calls her Martha Stewart, who I know we've mentioned before, so I won't get into it. Yeah. Cole tells Piper she's young and asks if she's really ready to die. Piper groans, and Phoebe tells her that she needs to get inspired to save her own life, as well as the lives of Leo and her and Paige, and because she can guarantee that Devlin isn't sitting on his butt waiting for inspiration to strike. Cut to Devlin and a bunch of warlocks somewhere underground or possibly in an alley. It's very tough to tell. Yeah, it was super tough to tell. Yeah, he's giving a speech about them having to work together. They all seem to be on board. He uh, stands inside the circle and uses the ring, uses his little green lantern, his little red lantern power. And yeah. shoots some inspiration into their faces. And the funniest part is that as he goes, he's he's just holding out his his hand with the ring and spinning in a slow circle to imbue them all with their powers. And they and, all tip their heads back. Yeah, they all do the tip their heads back thing. But the funniest part, and it was just, I swear, I'm probably one of the only people who noticed it because I noticed these things. So I'm probably one of the only people who noticed it because the red light was done in post. Mm hmm. The final two that he, re- that he, like... They did it before the light hit him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, they, they, they did their head back before the ring got anywhere near them. Yeah, I And saw it was that. just like, oh, oh. Mm-hmm. So that must have been the best take. Yeah, it's like, it's like trying to do wave choreography. Not everyone's going to be fully in sync. Not so much. Yeah, anyway, he tells them to prepare themselves and not to be late, and they all blink out. Back at the manor, the girls are making the potion on a small table in the wicker room as the boys look on. Cole is pacing a bit. Leo mentions them trying to call for the ring again. Phoebe assumes that Devlin has figured out a way to protect it. And Leo mentions that the muses that haven't been captured have gone into hiding, which means the world is going uninspired. Yeah. The issue there is that evil is being inspired, so the balance may tip toward evil. So they need to work fast. Cole is, of course, worried that they've never gone into the underground without him to protect them. Piper's like, we have the potion, the spell, the power of three, and the element of surprise. Yes. Cole says that they don't know where Melody is. Paige says, oh, she's in the ring. Cole reminds them that the ring is on the finger of a warlock who could be anywhere, doing anything, with any number of demonic powers, and he doesn't feel right about this. Cole then asks Phoebe not to go. She reminds him that she felt the same way every time he shimmered out to go to the underworld, but like him, she has to go. She kisses him. They pick up the potions. Leo tells them to be careful, and they speak the spell, with Phoebe saying the first line, Paige saying the second line, Piper saying the third line, and then all three of them saying the final line. Being of creativity, we call ourselves now to thee. 
Your light now darkened in a ring shall feel the power of three we bring. And they disappear in the nice swirly white lights. Yeah. And the funniest thing for me about this scene is that Paige put the vial of potion down the front of her shirt between her boobs because she doesn't have pockets. Mm -hmm. The problem, she's not wearing a bra. Or if she is, it is the thinnest bra ever because we can see her nipples. The shirt might have a shelf bra. Maybe. That's the only thing I can think of. Because, like, see how loose it is on her? Yeah. Otherwise, they're just, like, flapping about in the wind, just like the shirt. Yeah. So it's probably got, like, a shelfy bra type of thing. Possibly. But I just thought it was funny. Which anyone above an A cup cannot use. Well, a small B. It depends on, like, if you're a B because you have the, like, the cup size or the band size B. Like. Yeah. Like, if you have a band size B, that might work, because you'll still have pretty large boobs, because the way, the way Bryce says his scale up is so fucking Oh, high. man. Yeah. Let's, let's not get on a tangent about women's clothing, because we'll be here forever. I mean, we're always on a tangent about women's clothing with this show, because they're clothing. It's, it's true. It's true. Phoebe's fucking pantaloons. Oh, my God. Yes. But, yeah, I just think it's hilariously funny that, like, she has no pockets, and so she stuck it down her boobs. Yep. <laughs> like, Why not? It's nature's pocket, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the only PG-rated nature's pocket. Already then. We cut to P3, where 40s night is happening. There are posters on the wall urging people to buy war bonds, which are debt securities issued by a government to finance military operations to try and control inflation. Piper, Phoebe, and Paige all appear on the stairs as three women are singing Boogie Boogie Bugle Boy, which I have done in concert. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very iconic World War II song. It was a big hit for the Andrews sisters. And it got stuck in my head for days. Yeah. And now See, now I have the second song that they sing stuck in my head. Mm. Yeah, Phoebe is for a second worried that they've gone back in time again. And Piper's like, no, we're at P3. Yeah. Paige thinks that 40s night looks amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be honest, it, it looked it looked really good. Yeah, like, not everyone's costume was perfectly period accurate, but, like, Most they got the Most of the, the guys were in military outfits. Military outfits or zoot suits with the big fedoras. Yeah. Like, actual fedoras, not trilbies. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it it was very funny though that I loved that most of the men who were in military outfits were in sailor uniforms. Fair. I did see a few like regular army uniforms though. Yeah. Um, but like the sailor uniforms are white, and so it was super uh-huh. easy to notice uh-huh. them. I really loved. We we won't see him for now, but uh, one of the warlocks is a black dude with dreads, and he was also wearing the fedora, and I'm like, that's really cool. Your hair is super not period accurate, but I love it yeah. in that outfit. That's great. Yeah, but, you know, you're not going to change your hair just for a party. Not much. Yeah. Not permanently. Yeah. Necessarily. Unless you're just like, fuck it. Yeah. I mean, if anything, you'd wear a wig or something, but, you know. Uh-huh. I mean, people have changed their hair more for less. I know, but I I just, like, you know. I've known a few people who've done the St. Baldrick's thing of just, like, shaving it all off. Yeah, but I just, you know, I don't, I don't think that you would do it just for a single party. That's all I'm saying. Maybe on a dare? Maybe on uh, a dare, yeah. but, you know, that's what Yeah. Uh, anyway. Kuiper tells them to focus, saying the spell didn't bring them to the underworld, so Melody, Devlin, and probably many more warlocks are at P3. And we cut to a shot of Devlin sitting at the bar, drinking a martini, and as he goes to eat the olives, we go to commercial break. Yeah. We come back to the manor at night, pushing in through a tree with no leaves, because apparently Muse is disappearing, makes the leaves fall off the trees. Trees are very sensitive. They need a lot of inspiration to create all of that fucking chlorophyll. Mm-hmm. Liam and Cole are in the wicker room. Cole is pacing while Leo sits in a chair, hands on his head, resting resting his lovely head in his hands. Mm-hmm. Cole wonders how Leo can just sit by, doing nothing, and Leo tells him to shut up, because he's concentrating to be able to hear if the girls call for him. Though if they're actually underground, he wouldn't have been able to hear them, right? Just saying. Yeah. Cole is certain the girls have walked into a trap because he's realized that Devlin needed numbers and probably has already prepared an ambush. Leo then realizes the girls are at P3. Cole reminds him that they can't use their powers in public, silently asking for Leo to bring him to them. Leo says he promised, meaning he promised not to orb Cole anywhere, but Cole reminds Leo that he only promised the girls not to be orbed underground. Yeah. We cut back to P3, where the ladies on stage are now singing the Andrew Sisters' other popular song, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree with Anyone Else But Me. Anyone Else But Me. 
Mm-hmm. Anyone else but me. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Piper, Phoebe, and Paige are walking through the crowd. They pass by the bar, and Bev, who's in a very sparkly back dress with long black gloves, calls out to get Piper's attention. Piper is startled, drops the potion she was holding, and no, it explodes. she fucking throws it. Yeah, but, like, like she drops it. Like, it was no, just, no, no, just boom. Yeah, but, like, not a, oh, whoops, it slipped out of my hand, in a, like, threw it down kind yes. of drop. Yes. It explodes. In the way you drop a bomb. Yes. Or a vanquishing potion, apparently. Or a flash grenade. Yeah. Which is effectively what these are. True. Um, yeah, Bev is impressed by the fireworks and then compliments the look of the club. Piper calls her a genius, much to Bev's confusion, and then they all walk off. Well, all the girls walk off, not Bev. Correct. Phoebe questions why Bev is a genius, and Piper mentions that the strobe lights at P3 will work the same the way that the potion was going to and stop the warlocks from blinking. She says that she'll freeze the innocents, and they can feel free to vanquish anyone who's still moving. She then reaches over the bar, flipping one switch to turn off the house lights, and flipping the switch marked Specialty, which turns on the strobe lights. And... Immediately, we can see shots of, like, various warlocks in period dress kind of, like, shielding their eyes a little bit. Yeah. And then Piper stands in the middle of the crowd and just generally freezes the room. And then we start hearing warlock groans. And it was, like, in the captions, warlocks groaning. groaning. Yeah. Piper blows one of them up. One of them throws an energy ball at them. Paige calls for it. It orbs out and then into her hand. She throws it back at the warlock, vanquishing him. And we see Melody getting dragged through the club, crying out to Phoebe for help. Paige then starts to go after her, but Piper stops her. And a warlock hits Paige in the shoulder with a spark of some sort. Yeah, she gets flung into the bar, does does nice little, like, 360 spin. Yeah, and falls on the floor. Phoebe tells them to stay while she gets Melody. Melody calls out for her again. Phoebe kicks the warlock who was coming at her, and we get my favorite error thus far, like, ever. As the warlock goes down, he knocks into a woman who is supposed to be frozen, but she reacts like anyone who, you know, just gets knocked into would react. Her arm goes up, and there's a small ack that comes out of her mouth and they tried to cut away but they didn't do it fast enough so it was noticeable if you were paying attention and i watched that like a dozen times because it was the funniest thing ever because she's standing there holding a drink in one hand in like mid-conversation as she was frozen and she gets hit and it's like her entire just her arm goes up and (laughs) and then she tries to stop herself I, i think i need to watch this when we're done here oh my god it was just it was the best moment, and I loved every second of it. And I literally watched that that like three seconds, like a dozen times. Uh-huh. Anyway, yeah. Um, Phoebe calls to Piper, who blows him up, and then Phoebe goes over to Melody and asks if she's okay. And when when she blows him up, the person who who accidentally made made movement, all we see is just the back of her arm. They <laughs> they just shifted the camera over just slightly. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Yeah, Phoebe pulls Melody over to the girls, and Piper turns all of the lights back on, and then says, whoever doesn't want to die can leave. Yeah. Who doesn't want to die? Yeah. (laughs) And the rest of the warlocks all blink out. Phoebe says that they should leave, and then they head out to the alley. Paige holds onto her shoulder, where she got, you know, hit by that spark, mentioning that they don't have the ring. And Piper's like, it's okay, we have Melody, we can get the ring next. Phoebe reminds Piper that she's forgetting something, and Piper remembers that everyone inside is still frozen, so she heads back into the club. Phoebe goes to check on Paige as Melody walks up to Phoebe, smiling. Phoebe again asks if Melody's okay. Melody replies, she is now, and then touches Phoebe's face and tries to burn her. Now, the way this happens visually before they do the shit in post is that Siobhan Flynn just puts her hand on on the side of Alyssa's face and just starts, like, shaking it, Mm -hmm. which is hilarious. Yeah. It was like she was doing, like, a cheek pinch kind of thing, but without the pinching. Yeah, without the pinch. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paige seems to be in shock as she does nothing, but a la convenience, Cole shows up right then and punches Melody in the face, knocking her out of the way. Yeah. Leo goes over to check on Paige as Phoebe throws the potion at Melody. Cole pulls the ring off of her finger and she changes back into Devlin. Devlin then throws Cole across the alley and into some boxes and pallets. 
Piper comes running back out. Phoebe tells her to blow him up. She tries, but it doesn't work. Devlin says he's too strong for her and mentions having reinforcements. The girls say the spell. Evil is a faithful foe, but good does battle best. We witches will, with these words, waste the warlock's evil zest. Devlin blows up and his thusly vanquish. Phoebe helps Cole up, hugging him and thanking him for coming. He thanks her for having him, and then gives Paige the ring. Paige pulls back the red jewel because apparently this is a poison ring. Mm-hmm. Um, it lets all of the muses out, with only Melody staying in, like, appearing to be in front of them. Yeah, so Paige didn't need to, like, use her power to orb out the the muses, which means that anybody at any time could have just popped that ring open. Mm hmm Just saying. Yep. Anyway, Paige hands Melody the ring to be sure it gets back to the good guys. Melody says she should go. Phoebe tells her not to be a stranger and hugs her, and Melody says that she wouldn't dream of it. And then she quickly hugs Piper and Paige. They all say goodbye. Phoebe wonders if they should go back to the party. Paige says she's inspired to spend the evening at home. And Leo's like, hey, guys, hey, guys, you forgetting, forgetting something? something? And they and all, all look, look at, at Melody. Melody. They realize what they need to do, and so they each take a line to say the spell. Being of creativity, hide yourself now from me. Your light that shines upon our face, from our vision now erase. Melody fades into invisibility. The girls are very pleased with themselves. They head inside, and we get some nighttime transition shots. Yep, we get to see the Triangle Building and the dazzling lights of the city at night, as well as the Ghirardelli sign, bright and beautiful, before fading into the manor. We see candles lit and 40s-style music is playing. Paige is painting in the attic. She is now wearing a long sleeve black shirt with her hair pulled back with a little clip on either side of her head. We don't see what she's paired that with or what she's painting. But she's at least got better fake painting technique than fake drawing technique. Yes. Down in the kitchen, Piper and Leo are having a romantic dinner. Piper is in a long sleeve red shirt with her hair in pigtail braids, and Leo is in a gray sweater. They feed each other some food and they kiss. It was adorable. Mm -hmm. Cut to B3, still decorated for 40s night, but empty of party guests. Phoebe comes down the stairs. Dressed in a long white dress that has a high neck but low back and belled cap sleeves. With cushions. Like yeah, like a, like a shoulder sleeve. pad kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, shoulder pads. There is a slit on the leg and ruching with lace and sparkles up the left side that angles to the right side. Her hair is up with matching white lace flowers in it. It was very Billie Holiday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It was really nice. Like, honestly, I think someone saw a picture of Billie Holiday, like one of the classic ones, and they're like, we should find this outfit for this night. Yeah. Which, honestly, it's bordering on 30s, but that's still fine. Cole, Cole. is waiting for the bar, dressed in a typical soldier's outfit. It kind of looked like they might have said, oh, I borrowed this from Leo. Yeah, a little Which bit. Which would have been hilarious. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. They slow dance under the lights and the music in the club. And we go to the end credit. Yes. It was... It was very nice. It was a very sweet moment. And I enjoyed how it ended because it was like, okay, they all get to be happy for a minute. You know? It was lovely. It was. Yeah. So, with the episode over, we are on to ratings. Mm hmm. I'll go first. Okay. I'm going to give this one 8.5 out of 10 peekaboo pantaloons. Okay. I like it. I went for 8 out of 10, blinker, no blinking, like Swiper, no swiping yeah, from yeah. the Explorer. I, it would have been something with 40s, with PH mm -hmm. instead of F, but again, visual joke, so I didn't go for that. But, <laughs> but like, legit, I was just like, this is absolutely blinker, no blinking. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just great. Actually, your rating reminds me, I, for some reason, I woke up the other day, and the first thought in my head was, Computer Dora the Explorer, <laughs> which would actually work in Dora. Because Computadora is the Spanish for computer. Yep. But yeah. Anyway, we're on to outfits. Yes. Uh, for Piper and Paige, I didn't mind the outfits that they wore most of the episode. Yeah, yeah. Those were my, my things. But for Phoebe, the final dress, without a doubt. Actually, I liked Piper's final outfit better. I didn't like the, the weird sleeveless, like, frayed thing. I didn't mind it. And, like... I, I just... I didn't yeah. care for it. Particularly, I think it was the color. Yeah. If, if it, had it had been, been like, a color. green... 
Yeah. I would have been happier with it, but it was just a beige. Yeah. It looked like canvas. It didn't, yeah. it didn't, didn't inspire me. It didn't spark joy? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like that being a meme now. Yeah. This sparks joy. This does not spark joy. Yeah. Much better than the Drake meme. Hmm. Which people keep trying to replace the Drake meme. I keep seeing the Drake meme around. Like, yeah. get with the program. Like that meme is gone now. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still, I still really enjoy the denim coat. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, Piper's. I still like the pantaloons. Piper's purple velvet. Yes. Oh, Suede. So good. Or yeah. Pur- that, that purple jacket just, yeah. just so. Because Paige so had the good. green velvet one. That was nice. Yes. Just so good. Also, I really loved how at the beginning, Paige and Phoebe had kind of opposite outfits going on. Where Paige was white on top, red on bottom, and Phoebe was red on top, white on bottom. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was a fun visual thing, like when we saw them going out the door near the beginning. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh, hey, look, inverse. Yeah, it was quite nice. Mm-hmm. So, with ratings done and outfits done, we are on to social media. Woo-hoo. As always, you can email any questions or comments to charmedchats at gmail.com. And you can find all of the links to whatever we mentioned in the episode today at charmedchats.com, which is where you can also find the links to our Twitter, our Tumblr, Instagram, Redbubble, and Patreon pages. Also, don't forget to join the Discord if you are a patron, but just, you know, putting it out there for everybody that we will be opening the Discord to our listeners. Um, There will be a thing to listen for, Mm -hmm. and when you hear it, you will... A secret passphrase. Yeah, and when you hear it, you will know what to do, so be listening for that. Okay, bye. (laughs) No. Um, (laughs) That's not how we end this one. No. Um, So, until next time. Sleep tight. Don't let the warlocks bite. Bye. Bye. Bye.